My name is Adam Chow, I'm an anthropologist of Chinese religion. I'm a colleague of Professor Hans Mandarin in the East Asian Studies Department. And it's, it's my pleasure to be chairing this session uh, on behalf of the Humanitas Chinese Studies um, Resident Professor event. Uh, our next speaker is Amy uh, Li Xiaofan, uh, talking about uh, connecting with Chinese antiquity, the case of 20th century Francophone writers and artists. Okay, so thanks for coming. And so my talk will be a bit different from the ones preceding uh, mine because I'm looking at um, Chinese antiquity in 20th century France. Um, and my question is um, how non-Chinese people are also interested in Chinese. Okay. And so um, in the 20th century, Francophone artists and writers encountered Chinese antiquity and drew inspiration therefrom. And I focus on three uh, artistic figures that are representative of three different ways of engaging with a, a Chinese antiquity. One is a painter, the second an uh, artist poet, and then the third one a contemporary French writer. So uh, two important questions I would consider in my talk is firstly that of cultural transmission. Now the reception of a foreign culture remote in time and space always poses problems of understanding or misunderstanding of the ethics of its appropriation or misuse, and even in cases of <coughs> creative misuses. And also the question of what to appreciate and what to criticize in this kind of creative misuse. Secondly, the question I reflect on is the broader one about how modern and contemporary people connect with antiquity, in this case Chinese antiquity, and how it is pertinent to both people from non-Chinese cultures and Chinese cultures who are interested in China. Now, um, uh, as firstly the context for 20th century France, there was increasing interest in a knowledge about Chinese antiquity among 20th century um, artists and writers working in France. Um, and this interest in China went hand in hand with their search for new aesthetics and thought. So what particularly attracted the imagination and intellectual curiosity of French thinkers was not, in fact, the turbulent China that was contemporaneous to them, but actually the very remote pre-modern China, for instance, the classical Chinese texts, the enigmatic aphorisms of the Tao Te Ching, and traditional painting and medicine. Now, for the French especially, connections between China and France were already established in the 17th century, uh, by French Jesuit missionaries, who were also pioneers in writing about China, studying the Chinese language, and translating classics. And uh, because of this influx of um, Chinese texts into uh, Europe and France, this is why the French historian, Pierre in the 19th century, he called this inspiration from China the Oriental Renaissance. Now, by the time of the early 20th century, However, representations of China were becoming stereotypical and very much soaked in colonialist imagery. Uh, for instance, different kinds of chinoiserie and Chinese depictions of Chinese people as either old sages, cunning merchants, or dower-like women. And for the more critical thinking French intellectuals, they wanted, they felt there was a need not only to discover Chinese culture, but more importantly, to rediscover it and to rethink China in resistance to very simplistic ideas about it. Um, Louis Renou, who was uh, one of the most influential French Sanskritists at the time, but also a pioneer in bringing um, Oriental culture into France, generally speaking, so he said that, quote, Orientalism has entered into our ways of thinking without our being fully conscious of it. But there are still so many prejudices and so much ignorance uh, in the vulgarizations of culture. Um, so, um, I, uh, I think that um, this whole uh, intellectual context at the time shows that in the 20th century um, there was um, a, a rediscovery or the, the, the need to rediscover China. And so, to start with, this rediscovery was heralded by an increase in serious scholarly studies that aimed at deepening academic and public knowledge about ancient China. So in 1980, uh, 1928, the book on the left was published, which uh, illustrated mythology of Asia. And um, there were explanations of um, 
religious images written by prominent scholars such as Henri Maspero and Claude Maitre, and in the, in the preface, the preface, which was written by uh, Paul Louis Gouchou, who was a French philosopher who adapted Japanese haiku in French. What he said is that today another cultural enrichment begins, one that is even more wonderful than the Western. Western man has a new heritage to receive and share, a heritage that's greater than that of classical antiquity. And then he says, can modern people consider themselves cultivated if they're only nourished by European culture? And th this is the core for looking towards other cultures, especially the Orient, or especially Chinese and Indian cultures at that time. And also other influential technological works started to emerge, for instance, Martin Trane's Dragon uh, which uh, was divided into four main sections that each addressed important aspects of ancient Chinese culture, such as expression of thought, a cosmic system, and sects and schools. Of course, uh, this book has its own problems, such as being idealizing or not having enough evidence, but it became a classic in Sinology and was very well received, especially among the French intellectual circles, and received not only by um, Sinologists, but by artists and the literary writers, So, which makes me go on to my first um, painter. Um, so uh, Babjis, he was one of the French avant-garde of the 20th century, and he was a Polish-French painter and brother of the famous French philosopher Pierre Klosowski, uh, which you see on the uh, photograph when they were children. And uh, so his, his family was a very artistic one, and they had connections with Hilke and um, many poets, avant-garde poets at that time. And Babjis had a very early interest in Oriental, and especially Chinese, um, literature and painting. When he was a child, he illustrated um, the drums um, as different episodes of the drums' life, and he read translations of the drums both in English and Chinese, because one of his mother tongues was English as well. So uh, he was um, fascinated in especially um, Taoist literature ideas, aesthetic ideas, and um, the theme of dreams. Now, Baltis first experimented very much with different styles, so he is a very eclectic um, painter. He sometimes paints something very close to this Italian primitive painters like this, uh, the, the writers of Baltis, and he seems to be in very much in the European tradition, but uh, sometimes he seems very surrealistic or does something very weird, like this one. <laughs> and then he also experimented with Japanese um, but from uh, for 20 years of his life, he was drawing different paintings of um, on the theme of dreams, and that had a very a distinct uh, drawing scene, a coding it, um, because um, he evoked the story of drums dreaming about the butterfly and then waking up and thinking of whether it was I drums dreaming about the butterfly or the butterfly dreaming about me. And so, um, and this is one about just this painting on the, on the left, which is La Falene, the moth. And this painting is a very drawn evocation, although formalistically it looks as if it's uh, echoing Gustave Moreau uh, and Salome, who is having John the Baptist's uh, apparition coming up to her. And in gesture wise, it's very much an evocation of Moreau's painting as well. But in terms of the idea and the metaphysics, of this painting, it's a very evocative of John's stream because uh, the apparition, if you can see the moth, which is just uh, below the girl's hand, is almost invisible. It's not very clear, but that's exactly what Baltus wants to do because he's asking the question about um, the question of reality and the question of fragility as well. In a sense, the girl seems to be um, trying to protect the moth from the fire. Uh, and there is a sense of the fragility of life, but also the fragility of the dream state, and the question of whether this whole thing is actually a real thing or a recollection of a thing. Um, and apart from the, uh, the theme of dreams, he also took a keen interest in Chinese mountains and water paintings. Um, these are this the desert, which is found in Chinese ink. The other one was Swiss. Um, a Swiss 
Italian um, landscape, which he painted in Chinese style. Um, and he also did another painting called Le Gauderon of the Swiss mountain landscape, but after Fan Quan, um, because he had, um, Baudis was reading uh, Gorsi about three distances, uh, where Gorsi was talking about Chinese landscape painting having three different types of depth, and in Gorsi's theory, the, the high distance would produce a lofty grandeur, deep distance, successive layers, and the level distance has a recession. And that was what Baudrillard was trying to recreate in Oro on the left. And he said that he felt very connected with Fan Quan because he, um, in, in painting, he seems to be uh, putting forth the artist's own uh, view of the world. It's not painting about realistic representation of the world, but a certain type of subjectivity and cosmology. So, um, uh, Baudis was one of the figures uh, which uh, represented a very aesthetic and also a visual approach to Chinese um, painting and aesthetics. My second figure I'm going to talk about is Ang Hing Yishu, who both worked with painting and um, poetry, um, but in another way. So Michel was a Belgian French poet, and he uh, was also a great Oriental Phil. He traveled to Asia, and especially China and India, and wrote the book of Bar-Bar-Bar-Mazi. And obviously from the title, he's actually referring to himself as a barbarian in Asian cultures, and feeling very humbled and awed by the uh, rich cultures of the East. And it is also one of the key texts where he is criticizing Eurocentrism. Now, like Borges, um, Michel came into contact with Chinese texts at an early age via translations, and he professed a great admiration for the three canonical Taoist texts, namely the Dao De Jing, Zhongzi, and the Lietzi. And he says he uh, admired especially the style of Taoist texts where words are used sparingly, or actually he was saying in Chinese literature, generally speaking, words are used very sparingly. And he read uh, translations by Vigo, by Kmanek, <coughs> and probably Liu Kaowei's translation of the Lao Zhongs. But I also read Arthur Whaley and Herbert Giles. He was a very, um, say, well, academically informed person. Um, now, what he admired most in Taoist thought, as he professed, was a certain type of weakness and yielding nature, like the free movement of water, and also the emphasis on preservation of the body and life was and that he developed into a metaphysics of the line and different polygraphic and ideographic ways of representation. So these are different experiments he did with the line because um, he said that in Western painting or in Western art, the line has been very determinative. It's directly linked to the formalistic way of thinking. However, he wanted to break up the determinism and the clarity of the line and make a line very, uh, make a line imaginative and dreamy. And in this poem, he wrote the uh, Adventure of Lines, which was dedicated to Paul Klee. He says that a line uh, encounters a line, a line avoids a line. The Adventure of Lines is the line just for the pleasure of being a line. And he says a lion also dreams. Nobody has uh, up till now allowed a lion to dream. And um, that is how he had um, adopted the line from what he understood as um, part, uh, an integral part of Chinese painting as one of his predominant expressions. Apart from this, he was also linking his metaphysics of the line with Chinese ideographs, where you can see his book in Ideogram on China, where he was exploring how ideographs were also related to human body movements, but also animals, because he um, was playing with the idea, which he thought was Taoist, um, that humans and animals exist in a a non-hierarchy and form a cosmological whole. Um, and Michaud, um, in, in this term, when he writes about ideographic paintings, he's not naive like Israel Pound of Fenelosna, who believed that Chinese characters are vivid shorthand pictures of the operations of nature. And 
And you should also criticize the clothes that who claim that you could understand Chinese characters and Japanese without learning the language. <laughs> so Michaud did not believe that uh, Chinese language showed a more primitive or original natural state. Rather, he thought that they were actually a super-cultivated state, a very sophisticated system of science that demanded true learning. So he felt that um, to, to actually learn or, or express Chinese ideograms, you have to do a lot of work, in fact. It's not just being natural and, and spontaneous. At least it's not a spontaneity that comes very easily. Um, and what, what he wrote here was that um, in, in his paintings of, of ideographs or iconographs, he was trying to express the vitalist type of Elan the, the vital impetus, where he thought Chinese um, characters and ideographs could express, but in his own way um, of uh, being Chinese. Um, so, I come to the last part of my uh, talk, which is how after Baudis and Michaud, the contemporary French writer Pascal Guignard was taking on Chinese antiquity. So Guignard is very different because he writes a lot about the philosophy of language, but he evokes um, classical Chinese argumentation and what he calls classical Chinese logical thought, um, such as found in Gongfenlong and drums and parts of Lietz and the Mots. So firstly, he says that he does not consider himself a, a, a writer because he doesn't want the role of the writer. And he, just as Jones doesn't want any title or role of a sage, and in a way analogical to how Jones wants to speak without words, Guignard wants to write without being a writer. And he seeks uh, inspiration from Taoist philosophical thought by rethinking the nature of language and its relationship to the world and experience. So he said, for instance, that um, one of the uh, schools of thought that I owe most to is the thought of Gong Xuan Long. And he said, especially oh, with this, um, he says there are two propositions from Gong Xuan Long that I learned most from. One is firstly, there are thoughts which derive from nowhere. The second is there are meditations or there are thoughts without result. So what I thought was I should look at Gong Xuan Long and see where these come from. And um, obviously I didn't find anything like this in the Gong Xuan Long. <laughs> so uh, because uh, what Ding Yang was uh, referring to was this very obscure and difficult text called the Zhu Lun, the, the, referencing or the, the, the referencing of objects um, in Gong Xuan Long, where he's talking about how the reference to a thing and the thing itself are different. Now, uh, the only thing that looks slightly close to what Ying Yang says is when mm -hmm. Gong Xun Long is talking about how, um, although reference by itself, for instance, the name of an object, is not something that concretely re exists in reality. However, if we don't have this reference itself, we would have no means of speaking of reality of things in itself. But um, from, from my reading of Gong Xun Long, obviously the um, propositions or the thoughts that Guignard said he got from Gong Xun Long do not really exist there. Um, now, uh, Guignard also has some deliberate aphoristic argumentation, which he takes from um, Taoist uh, literature. For instance, he says, nothing is the measure of nothing, and nothing, um, uh, nothing measures the measure. Or he says, there is no sense because there is no nonsense, but there is no nonsense because there is no sense. Um, and so, so this kind of um, playing with paradoxes is very evocative of Taoist literature. And sometimes he does quote something that actually does exist in, in the classical Chinese text itself. For instance, this part where he says uh, about Lietz, like something that comes from sound can be heard, but that by which sound is produced is never caught. And when we look at the Lietz, the, the first chapter of Tian Rui, we do find uh, a sentence that is talking about this, about uh, what causes sound to be heard is not that uh, what you hear itself. So um, with Guignard, I find uh, it, um, he's a very, um, I find a very mixed attitude towards him. So on, on the one hand, he does, um, the good thing he does is he does bring such obscure thinkers, at least very obscure to the French public, 
um, into attention, and he uh, renews an interest in ancient Chinese um, language and literature by making these references to these um, old thinkers and texts. But on the other hand, he is obviously um, misappropriating them and loosely attributing to them many things that you don't really find in this ancient Chinese text itself. So um, the question is um, uh, what I have mentioned in the beginning, the question about creative misuse and uh, reappropriation. So I think the French case here, firstly, um, allows us to understand how Chinese antiquity is not only of significance for modern and contemporary China. So these French thinkers and artists exemplify one strand of the French reception of Chinese culture that particularly focuses on Chinese aesthetics and thought. But uh, this does not mean that they do not misunderstand Chinese antiquity or that they do not use it to their own purposes. Although they profess a passion for Chinese culture, they usually do not have an in-depth knowledge of it, and their sources of knowledge are all of a mix and not very reliable. But this also shows a crucial problem with all cultural transmissions across geography and different temporalities. Although the transmitted culture inevitably changes in the process, the ethics of cultural representation and reappropriation does not disappear, and it cannot disappear. But on the other hand, we also need to realize that there is no independent reality of the culture that's transmitted and received, no independent reality that exists completely outside of this transmission itself. So in other words, transmission and reappropriation are not passive vehicles that work upon the culture in question, but also inherent in this culture that's transmitted and which actually uh, actively transform it. So um, the French case actually poses to us a question how to connect to Chinese antiquity in a starker way because it involves two different cultures and languages that do not share one genealogy. But um, it seems to be maybe a less of a problem for Chinese contemporary Chinese people themselves because um, we somehow see there is a genealogy or an inheritance in that. But I also believe that um, nobody automatically inherits antiquity by being born to a cultural context. I think antiquity is something that you need to work upon and truly engage with uh, to gain a most, more than superficial knowledge of. Um, that's all. Thank you.